So how do you switch the camera? Is it one of these? This one over here, I can control it. So, this one. Oh boy. Cool. It's a little too much space. Hey Paul, it's Peter. Hey, I'm in uh, 2 North 2307. I want to make sure you guys are getting the audio. Okay, are you getting content? Or... This is still an issue in this room, <clears throat> so.
Yeah, 2.307. Cool. All right. And the mic's still working. So you're still hearing us on the mic. Check one, two. Cool. All right. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Can you see over the podium, or do you want to go up one? Yeah, no, it's fine. If you can see over the podium. Uh -huh. I should have brought my iPad, right? This is, this well, is. I don't know, it goes pretty fast. I can never mm -hmm. catch up with it if I'm just trying to. Can you see uh, fine? Beautiful suit. Oh. Is it silk? This looks no, beautiful. It. It looks beautiful. Got it. Two nice sales. Uh huh. How you doing? Uh, well, I'm uh, I'm rather upset with my therapist. And they're able to make my how oh. oh, is your hearing? Okay. Mine is terrible. I've got a coming up here another appointment to do some manipulations with these hearing aids. I just don't have the best uh, reception, and it's very frustrating when you can't hear. Is this <laughs> 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 Blair. <laughs> 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 
Slim well, thank you. Good, good. Sit down, sit down. <laughs> There, so I can just. Uh -huh. I'm a better tester, whether I can hear whether for hearing. You're not. We left in 74. She went right to Harvard then.
67 to 74. And uh, then on the other side. And when did you go to Haiti? We went back to Haiti to uh, a different place. In a, in a new area, a different church. We just uh, working with some younger person there. And so that when we got down to the people that would have had their understanding of the This is not the best place to see Gretchen because she's so I know what she looks like. This is Jewel. I don't know what she looks like. I do, yeah. I do too. But I have to read lips. <laughs> hey, Gretchen. Don't you have something you can stand on? <laughs> to get a little higher? So you're in the progression. You finish your if you could be elevated a little bit so I could reach your lips. Would you read my lips? Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm Marsha Walsh. Hey, Marsha. Pleasure I'm to meet so you. Good to meet you. Good to uh, finally meet you guys. I've heard so much about both of you. I just got back from the meeting, so... I did. Please listen. Pardon me? Listen, listen to my sign of... Come on. I've heard some good things, so... No, yeah, I just got back from Haiti, and um, so it was a good trip. And I hadn't been back since 2008 or so, so it was nice to get back. Uh -huh. visit, so. so you had uh, you, you knew Haiti before the before the earthquake? Yeah, I worked there for about seven years, more or less. Uh, our family lived in Santo Domingo, but I worked on two, one or two weeks a month. Only all for like seven years. Okay, my son. Hi. I was well, the regional representative for American Love Olympics. this. Good color. Good. 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 I think we're going to see you there. Just recently came off um, doing public health work in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Hi, Lauren. I'm Tate. What are your things? Okay. I'm Tate. I got a great picture of you all. I hope you got it. I sent it to you from the golf tournament. I think you, you're the, you took a shot. <laughs> yep, yep. That's right. He, he went to another meeting and they were singing a song about bald men. He jumped right on that and he went right up there to dance with everybody. Right? It's my pleasure and also an honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gretchen Pilgrim. I think the size of the crowd today gives clear testimony to the regard in which she's held and her work is recognized. And she has described in the flyer, I won't go back through all those details, but she has a number of global health experiences in different countries over different years, and in particular has made contributions in helping to understand the importance of community-based health programs and their ability to achieve sustained and long-term reductions in child mortality and resource limited savings. Her lecture today is titled, Villagers in Health, How Local Community Can Contribute to Equity in Health Services. pioneers in this field. Susan Rifkin is with us today, and Ricky, Dr. Ricky, and uh, Mr. Hanch, who's brand new to us, but has had experience in how many countries? At least 15, 20. 15 or 20 countries. Uh, my husband, Dr. Warren Berger, is here, and one of our nurses has been many, many times to Haiti, 23 times to Haiti. So I want to thank all of you for coming, and uh, hope that you will uh, all of you, Blair Gifford, Dr. Blair Gifford is here, is one of the founders of the Center for Global Health. So there are plenty of people here for any of you students to inquire or talk to if you're interested. I mean, these people all have experience that you wouldn't believe in so many countries in the world. So I hope I have a lot of that. Dr. Evan Carsey is a pediatrician who just got back from Haiti, pediatrician from Boulder. Um, 
and so many others who are here today. So thank you all for coming. Uh, the Denver, I hope you all got the handout and saw the article from the Denver Post. Uh, it's interesting the Ebola virus hit, and at first they were asking for medical teams and doctors and nurses, and now the Denver Post says, guess what? They are dependent upon community health workers. And if the epidemic is going to be stopped, it's going to be, have to be stopped in the communities by the workers and by people who can be trusted. One of the doctors who survived is going back to uh, Africa because he said, maybe those of us who have survived Ebola will be trusted. The only people that are going to be listened to are those who are trusted. And he felt that it was important for every survivor of Ebola to become one of those trusted messengers in his or her own country. So it's very appropriate that we talk about who are these workers then that WHO says are going to have to be the crucial answer uh, if we're going to stop the epidemic. Let's see, which button do I push? Is it this one? Dr. John, uh, Dr. Carl Taylor at Johns Hopkins says that community health has to be a three-legged stool, needs input from the community, a bottom-up approach, needs input from a change agent, which could be an NGO, a university, or a development project, and needs input and supervision and evaluation from top-down, such as a local government and or often the Ministry of Health. Community listening is an art by itself. It's very poorly done very often. Uh, people go out and do needs assessments. I don't believe in them. I think you need to do resource assessments. Uh, needs assessments go on and on forever and never end. But if you do a resource assessment, you have a, often a thread of how and where to begin. And then we, but we do need preliminary information. We need to know the structure, the demography, the function, and we use, need to use focus groups as well as research info. Very often, we've proven this in several countries, for example, the age at weaning, weaning practices are better found in a focus group and much more quickly than a detailed questionnaire. Uh, and so we're learning more, and if Molly Terhune is here, she can fill you in on how much anthropologists can help us along this line. We need to consider with the community and be sure that we have democratic representation from all corners. I have been to villages where I was asked to meet the health workers and found out that all of them were from the northwest corner of the village. And almost all the poorest of the poor lived in the southeast corner of the village. This is not democratic representation, nor will it reach the poorest of the poor, which is one of our real goals. The problems need to be identified by the community and by the health services. Now, if you ask any community anywhere in the world, and I'm talking about 20 or 30 countries, what they need, they'll always tell you a dispensary or a hospital. So you have to get beyond, and why do they say that instead of saying our babies are dying of tetanus and we need mothers to be immunized against tetanus, for example? Because they only have the frame of reference of what doctors and nurses do, and that is we build dispensaries and hospitals. So don't, we don't need to be surprised, but we have to go beyond that. So whose voice are we really hearing? In these meetings where we say, what are your needs, are the under fives represented? Who speaks for them? Are the women represented? Who speaks for them? What are the under fives basically dying of? What are the most common killing and disabling diseases by age group in that community? There are many places that we can go for this information, but the people themselves always usually know if we spend enough time with them. And this may take time. I, remember, I did a lot of work in Vietnam with Jerry Sternan, who's one of the best development workers and who capitalized on, so to speak, on the positive deviance approach. Jerry would visit one village 10 or 13 or even 23 times till he felt the people were really with him. And he had Vietnamese workers who understood and could work with the community. Home visits are very important even at the exploratory stage. And I always remind students, Dr. Paul Farmer, does everybody know who he is? <laughs> Dr. Paul Farmer never goes anywhere in the world to any of the stations where he works without doing home visits. Why do you think that is? I mean, he's the top person. 
and yet he does home visits. Jim Kim, his colleague who's now president of World Bank, always does home visits. So, you know, we often work with the people who are in charge and we don't understand where people are, themselves are coming from. So we need to define the norms with many meetings. This is a meeting in the Philippines. And we expect results. And the Schweitzer Hospital, where Warren and I worked in two different five-year programs, we were able to keep track of all our deaths, and we could look at the national rates versus the rates of under five mortality in the area where we worked. And this is just a testimony to working with the people and with resident home visits. Malnourished children are at risk today. So people, we, we see a lot of malnutrition. People say, well, it's an economic problem, it's an agricultural problem, it's a this problem, it's a that problem. All the things they're talking about, we could maybe remedy in 20 years. But the people are concerned about these babies, like the ones in this picture, who are malnourished today. And so we're concerned about having resident home visitors, making care accessible, working with women's groups, mothers' clubs. We need to be accountable to the community and also to the funder and to the, informa the information system begins, in our opinion, with mapping and numbering and making sure that no one is left out. You can go and hold a big meeting for immunizations and uh, growth monitoring, perhaps. And in that area, at that assembly post, you've reached 50 or 60 children. But if there are 200 children in that village, you haven't made much progress. How are you going to really reach them all? And who can be responsible? So we believe in community health workers who are really resident home visitors. Can everybody say that? Resident home visitors. It's different than an outreach worker that's trained seven centrally and goes out to do all things for all people at all times. A resident home visitor is absolutely a clue. And we need to be able to communicate our results to the people. I remember when tetanus of the newborn virtually disappeared in the Schweitzer Hospital area of 200,000 people. And the health workers got together and they were celebrating. But one of them stood up and said, now let's make war on diarrhea. So they were really understanding where the people were coming from. But the result of being able to celebrate the disappearance of tetanus was precious to those people. So our community health workers need to understand uh, adult education. And in the handout, you have Dr. Mar uh, a friend of ours who worked with us a lot, uh, Muriel Elmer, as she looked at adult behavioral change. Uh, one of you can maybe get, I'll tell you which one I want to talk about. I'd like to just acknowledge that there aren't enough handouts for everyone. This is an exceptionally well-attended lecture, but I will be sure to post the handouts on the lecture series page of the Global Health website. It's on the back of the Denver Post article about why we need health workers to be at Ebola. Um, so what, what Dr. Elmer discovered, and she's a nurse who went on for a PhD in adult participatory education, is that when people, when we, if we can have behavioral change, People first have to consider it, then they have to recall it and try it, and then they have to be willing to practice it, and finally we get behavioral change. So all those steps are very important. It's different than holding up a poster and saying, okay, feed your kids meat, eggs, and milk at least once a day, and everybody changes their behavior, right? Uh, so Muriel considered this, and in our nutrition uh, model that we used, we have found that positive deviants, uh, so-called positive deviants, are poor families in every village. So we're combating malnutrition worldwide. But guess what? In every poor village, in every country, there are well-nourished babies among the poor. And so we can step back and say, what are these people doing? Can we build education around what they already know and do in their precious traditions? And how do we do that? We have to allow them to overcome it. At the bottom of that cycle, Dr. Elmer discovered you have to allow people to practice and practice and practice. And the Coca-Cola company already knows that, and some of you have heard me lecture before. How many times does Coca-Cola say you have to hear their message before you try the new Coke? Seven times. And how many times do you have to practice drinking that Coke before it becomes kind of a habit? 
21 times. And how many times do we give a message in health education around the world, in nutrition or about combating cholera or whatever? We don't come close to that. So we need to learn from the advertising industry and get our health workers on board with this. So the example uh, in with the heart program, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, is that we had to, to do home visits to the point that we understood what was already going on. And then the mother becomes an apprentice where she can practice again and again and again. Where? In a fancy center? No, in somebody's home. Will mothers volunteer their kitchens to help train their neighbors in 26 countries? Yes. And we haven't had any problem with that. We're teaching in the village, with the villagers, allowing mothers to practice again and again. You don't serve your three-year-old beans. You serve your three-year-old pureed beans. Otherwise, guess what? The kid passes whole beans. So these kinds of things have to be involved in what we teach and how we teach. So I've already, this is just to say, re, re, help us remember that we need to let people practice. What do CHWs do? In Peru, the community help decide to communi conduct community registration, carry out monthly checklists so that no child was left out, do home visits, conduct or help with demonstration sessions, and fill out their monthly reports. What, how do we train community health workers? I'm going to show you from one country in Africa what they expect the health workers to learn. This is the community health worker handbook for one African country. They have to learn all this and then go out and be all things to all people. Do you think this will work? Do you believe in this? Or is it better to do skill by show, skill on the job training? And that's what we've come to believe does work. Now, it isn't that you don't need a reference book. This is a wonderful reference book. But if you get all the health workers together and teach them all this and send them out to do all things for all people at all times, it will fail. We do on the job competency based training. Can a health worker do this, yes or no? Not who gets A, who gets B, who gets C, and who almost flunks. But yes or no, can he or she do it? So how many health workers can we expect one CHW to reach? In general, 200 to 400 families is already a maximum. The paucity of health workers is partly because we don't understand this ratio. And each one, in our opinion, has to work with volunteers or a women's club, or a women's group, or a father's club. They can't just go out and do it all by themselves, but they have to have the skill of being able to form clubs, <coughs> form groups, people they can meet with. The health worker cannot say how many babies were born in this village and go door to door sometimes to every house, but he can get the mother's club together, and believe me, they know how many babies were born. They already know who's pregnant. Is that important? So supervision is our biggest problem. It must be direct and indirect, not punitive, but formative. And I can give you many examples. And we used, we used in Haiti a guest register that the malaria eradication people had used. When a health worker or anybody visits a house, they sign the guest register. And the little guest register stays in the house. How does that help supervision? How would you use the fact that the health workers have signed a guest register if the guest register if they visited? How would that help you supervise? Could you draw a sample of houses and go yourself and see who signed? That might be possible, right? So you can be, that's indirect supervision. But there's also direct supervision where you go with the health worker and say, Okay, this mom has a problem. Look, all three kids are covered with scabies. What do we do? What does this family have to do to get rid of scabies? Where does scabies hide? Often under the prejudice of the father. So the health worker may be able to cope with this, and you can supervise how she is coping with it. That's direct supervision. 
So the big model for Rex Bendall was the, was the head of the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, was always everyone deserves super supervision. And he also believed that skill by skill on the job training is best. What are the tasks and why? What is the skill? What are the evaluation indicators and who evaluates? And now I want to quickly go into undernutrition because it, it, it's underlying cause of death in more than a third of the children everywhere in the world. I don't know if any of you saw the Ebola follow-up on CNN last night, but the children that were being brought in and dumped literally on the, on the earth in front of a hospital, at least one or two of them were severely malnourished. So who is going to die of Ebola? You know, it's not 100% case fatality rate. Half of all people who get it survive. Who does not survive? We already know, based on other disease studies, that it's the undernourished who are least likely to survive. It takes a heavy social toll, and it accounts for 11% of the global disease burden. So we developed the positive deviance hearth nutrition model, and that's been applied in many countries, more than 20 countries in the world. And uh, the idea is to enable poor communities to independently and sustainably address the problem of malnutrition today. Because remember, in every village today, there are well-nourished children. It's time we looked at that, we said. So what development approach could alleviate current childhood malnutrition quickly, affordably, and sustainably in a culturally acceptable manner? And here's some gentlemen from one of the Muslim countries in North Africa who are fascinated with the fact that their children could be well-nourished, but it meant they had to permit their wives to leave home and get together in a volunteer kitchen. So they had to consider, was it, would this be worth it? It takes this kind of cultural training. So the positive deviant approach identifies solutions within the community today and enables some poor members of the community to have well-nourished children. So we call these people who, whose children are surviving and are doing well positive deviants. And that was introduced, that literature we owe to Dr. Marion Zeitlin, who did early studies with it. And guess what? It's being used to, to fight MRSA. Everybody know what MRSA is? We have disease resistant in many of our hospitals today. But guess what? There are some wards that almost never have any. Ah, that's a positive deviant ward. There are some surgical rooms that almost never have patients with MRSA. <coughs> that's a positive deviant surgical amphitheater. And this is being used to try to look at what's happening. So it's not just in nutrition that we can use this approach. But we have to do an inquiry. The positive deviant inquiry is a tool that provides clues. People ask me, can I have a copy of the inquiry? The answer is no. Illiterate people do wonderful positive deviant inquiries in nutrition around the world. If you send them out to do home visits to congratulate the mothers who are doing so well, they come back with all kinds of ideas. The last one I did in Haiti, the positive deviant mom said, I, I bring water to my house five times a day. And finally the nickel dropped for all of us. This woman had a clean household and the kids' hands were washed. Her children were not malnourished. Hygiene had a lot to do with it in that home. So we define this way the community norms and we conduct the inquiry and then we share results and talk about our findings. So we identify the positive deviant children, but also we rehabilitate uh, the others. Now I want to, I have, if I have time, I'll come back to an example from Mozambique, but in the meantime, I want you to help me look at what it might be in the equipment that a community health worker might need. So the first thing is, somewhere in the mix is a cold box, right? Can every community health worker carry a cold box to every house? No. So how, do, how are we going to vaccinate the kids? He needs this, we agree, right? How is this going to happen? 
we're already long beyond the belief that the child must come to the clinic or to the health center. If we do that, we'll get 30% of kids at most. So we have to go out. So how does this work? Well, afterwards, if any of you have time, you can talk to my husband who will tell you about uh, cold boxes that can keep vaccines cold for seven days or more, if carefully done. But we have to get mothers together, and somebody may have to carry something like this to the assembly post. That's why our health workers in Haiti have asked for donkeys. <laughs> so this is one thing that from time to time, not for every house, but for every assembly post, we need to have cold boxes. Now, the health worker will have a bag over his shoulder, and he will have some things in it, which might be interesting to think why. I'm sure all of you will recognize this. Why might he have this and this in his bag, in his or her bag? <clears throat> We've only recently got permission for health workers to carry this in Haiti. Why do they need it? What is it, first of all? It's a blood pressure cuff, right? A sphygmomanometer. Okay, we looked at what kills mothers in Haiti. What's the main cause of maternal mortality around the world? It's hemorrhage, but not in Haiti. It's eclampsia. What's eclampsia? High blood pressure in pregnant women, and it kills a lot of women. So early detection of hypertension might be very important in a country like Haiti, right? So, so this might go into the bag. What about this? <laughs> if you go to any developing country today and ask how many people have cell phones, it's almost 100%. And the health worker needs that, but he also needs something else. He needs to have a map of the village he's following, but also a cell phone directory. So he knows how to call headquarters, he knows how to call the leader of the volunteer mothers, or the father's club, or whatever. And so he may need some other things, like a map, and he can put the villages on there, and he can sometimes find villages that everybody's missed. A calendar, why might that be important? What's he gonna tell these people when he's there? Why would the health worker need a calendar? Hmm? When's the next health club meeting, or when is the next assembly post where vaccines will be available? So he needs to have that. My daughter teaches this kind of work in University of Texas, San Antonio, and this is what she gave all her the health workers that are working along the Dominican Republic and Haiti border. This is the directions of how to make oral rehydration therapy. Might that be important? What, what's, what's ORT used for? For diarrhea, right? So they have the formula there. And then, because there's been a register already of all the families, and that's how we like to work, from that register, and this register might be at headquarters, not in the box, but we can derive a roster of under fives for this village. We can derive uh, a roster of one, women 15 to 49 years old where notes can be kept or you can say present or absent. And we can report births and deaths in this area. And I love these because there's a, there's a duplicate. So if the death report or the birth report is given to the health worker to take back to his headquarters. The mothers in the village still can have a copy, or the health worker himself can have a copy. And we believe in home-based hand-carried health records. And so depending on the program, most countries have at least a wait-for-age record for children. And this also has the immunization record on the back of it. In this one, you can see that this child lost weight, weight for age. These cards show the 50th centile, and you're looking for the children who are malnourished, whose weights may be down here, 
and those who are well nourished to a pair of positive deeds. But these are hand carried, and the mothers guard them very often. In Nigeria, they said, oh, don't give these to the mothers. The mothers will lose them. The health centers lost them far more often than the mothers did. <laughs> so this is one for under fives. This is another model from Haiti. This is the model from Bangladesh. And I have many others, but what is new and different is the model for mothers. <coughs> a home-based mother's health record is very, very valuable. And this is sort of a work in progress. But my husband designed a way of helping mothers keep track of their periods and their family planning methods also on this. And this is the model from Leogon, Haiti that's being used in the field. And guess what? A teenage passport for help. Guess who loves this? The soccer kids. <laughs> so the, the soccer teams, women's soccer teams in Haiti were the first to have an adolescent health record. And the, wherever they've been to be consulted, whatever pill they're on can be recorded here. And then the boys wanted one. And so the workers said, but this is to help you keep track of your periods. <laughs> <laughs> And the boys said, well, give us one anyway. So we're working on a grip test for the boys, something they can keep track of. So home-based, hand-carried health records are one of the things the health agent would have examples of in his bag when he comes to do his home visit. And what about this? Might he need this? I'm pretty important. You could probably all make a list of the things he could use for clean water. He's going to need for lots of reasons in his bag. And then something that we're using in many countries because as women become immunized against tetanus, their babies are protected for the first few months of their life. That's how to fight tetanus. And it's a totally inexcusable situation that we still have tetanus in the world today. But we kept track of what happened, and there are still babies that come in with sepsis of the newborn from umbilical cord contamination. So it's very important for health workers to be able to give to pregnant women a way of making sure that the umbilical cord is properly cut and sterilized. So we owe this to St. Anthony's Hospital that helped us with this here in Denver, but the health workers and the traditional birth attendants and even people working in the dispensaries in Haiti have this little kit which can be sterilized and has sterilizing tape on it. And what's in it is two umbilical cord ties, a razor blade carefully wrapped and with a little bit of oil on it so it doesn't rust, a belly band which is an old sheet torn up, and uh, a gauze, uh, a piece of gauze to put over the umbilical cord and stump. So mothers deserve a way of making sure that their baby isn't going to have an infected. Now, it's better to go to the dispense, to the maternity unit. It's better to go to an area where there is a clean delivery guaranteed in your health care system. But mothers go into labor high in the mountains, hours away from a center. <clears throat> and so we found that mothers really appreciate having this as a backup for the TBA or whoever might deliver their babies. And these are being put together in Haiti as well as here. And my personal belief is the whole gamish should be sterilized. That's why we asked St. Anthony Hospital to try to sterilize these. And I, our packets were in newspapers and the nurses at St. Anthony said, oh dear, we have little steroid, very special kind of cloth. And so that's why this is in a very pretty little, but the, this can go also. Now, what else would the health worker need? In his bag. Some of you, how many of you worked in developing countries? Many, many of you. We have hundreds of years of experience here. <laughs> So what else would you like to see him have, or her, have in her bag? A clipboard. Hmm? A clipboard. A clipboard. A clipboard. 
Very good. And that's one of the things they asked for. Who else? What about a rain jacket? That's a common request that we have. We'd love to have a rain jacket of some kind. What else? Food. Just some food. Some food, right. And that for themselves, they're going to be out there for long hours of time, and they may, may not uh, be able to get back home to get food. What else? Writing utensils. Excuse me? Writing utensils. Writing utensils. And there was a pencil and pen in here that's very, very important. They need to write down uh, what the people are telling them. So you can think about this, but every single one of these that we've put in here deserves a training, right? <coughs> So each, each thing that, that's in here represents a session in training where women or men who are doing this work either become competent or not. So your training manual might come from here, and it might not look quite like this book where every disease is mentioned. It's, this is almost like an infectious disease training manual. As I say, I'm not against it, but training the health workers comes more from this than it should be from this. So that's the point I want to make. Any questions? Are, yes. Are the health workers trained on how to uh, use uh, first aid kits? In many countries, yes. And a first aid kit would be appropriate. I'm, I'm surprised somebody didn't mention that, but in, in many countries, yes. Any other questions? Yes? The community health workers that you're speaking about that you've worked with personally in all these countries, are most of them volunteers? Is that how you, you reach out to the community and ask, we would like community health workers to address X issue? Or are these people that have some previous, some form of medical training? Or how, how are you getting this population of community health workers? We, we have a dilemma about this worldwide. Because if you really want the health workers to be resident home visitors, that means that they reside in their community. And it may be very difficult to find someone who is highly literate, at least, to train in that community. But very often, we start with volunteers who help us with various things. They may help with the immunization program. They may help with distribution of antimalarials or something like that. But what can emerge and what, what needs to be happen is that the people recognize someone that they trust. Now, with the Ebola epidemic, the doctor who's going back to Haiti because he survived is exactly right. He thinks people will trust him. And the biggest problem they're having is that people don't trust the messengers. And so they're realizing more and more they need to depend on the health workers who are already known and discussed. But many of the best health workers are almost illiterate. Now, in most countries, they will not be recognized by the government because the government will have a certain standard, a certain exam they have to pass. And so we have often a two-tiered system where there's a community health worker recognized by the government, at least eighth grade level, usually, and with a salary. But he, in turn, he or she, in turn, must work, in my opinion, with volunteers within the community or women's cl men's clubs or health clubs or whatever if they're really going to reach the community. And at this level, you may have people that are almost illiterate. So that's been my experience. Uh, Susan, what about you? You've had a lot of experience. Well, India, for instance, has community residents as ASHA, the uh, accredited social activists, and the government pays them. And they are, uh, they have to have an eighth grade, about approximately, and they are paid depending on the, the state. Sometimes they're paid for the number of women they bring into the clinic to deliver. Some states, the state gives them a salary. It depends, it's been very, but so there are governments that do have community health workers. Thailand, Brazil, India come to, uh, to mind. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mickey, you have a comment on that? Um, most of the people I've trained as community health workers or TBAs or community-based trainers or helpers are illiterate. <laughs> I mean, I, I work mostly in South Sudan, Sudan, and the educational level is non-existent. Uh, you know, 
I don't want to say, but the government of South Sudan has, in the government, the government of South Sudan, 83% of the workers are illiterate in the government of South Sudan. So, if the government officials are illiterate, you can imagine what the status of the normal population is, uh, non-existent. So, we, we trained everybody, but it's hands-on, skill by skill, as uh, Gretchen is saying, uh, and that's the only way. I mean, we have a book, too, and the book I use for reference, uh, but no one else can read it. Uh, so we make pictures, uh, you know, a sun coming up, a noon sun, and an afternoon sun, and that's how you train to give medicines three times a day. I mean, so they can see pictures, and, you know, they can hear words, usually. Uh, so that's what we train with, is just other techniques. Okay. Well, I, is, does anybody else have any questions? This is very good. Yes, Dr. How long does it take to train one community health worker? Well, in, in our, it, it, well, we did a lot of what uh, Mickey was talking about. May I call you Mickey? Sure. <laughs> nine months was our formal program. Yeah. Yeah. The formal program may be six weeks up to nine months or more, but uh, if you do skill by skill on the job training, what our workers did, we, we felt that we were in an area where tetanus was overwhelming when we first went to Haiti. So it was a low-hanging fruit to immunize all the women. If we waited till we had a health worker in every village, we'd have waited a long time. But all the women go to marketplace at least once or twice a week. So where do you immunize women? In the marketplace. What skill do you need to do that? We could train health workers to become very competent at immunization. That was a skill now they had under their belt. Then we could look at the other things that were ki uh, killing or disabling diseases of women and children with the communities. So then what was the next skill and the next skill and the next skill? So it might, you might say it took three years before they were thoroughly trained, but all the while they were practicing. So that's another approach. Uh, but in many countries, they, they just get all the health work. You pass an exam, you get together, you, you have to learn all the material that's presented to you, and then you go out to be a health worker, and which personally I think is not as effective as skill by skill. Yes? A couple points, Gretchen, I'd like to make. One is sort of in the follow up from the questions about community health workers and how you select community health workers and how do you keep them on, you know, on board at, in the community, right? Because that's one of the main challenges I've always found is sometimes you train folks and with those new skills, they move on to something else. Especially if you train like a, a skilled birth attendant, um, they'll move on to a, maybe a, bar, a larger urban area or whatnot. So I think one of those things we have to look at is that we have to find what sort of incentives motivates people to stay, both in, in the work they're doing and also in the villages where they're from. And um, we found that sort of that recognition, especially for community health workers, the recognition in their community of the work they do is a key motivating factor for people to stay and to want to become, for other folks to want to be involved in sort of the community health work as one. And another thing is I think that it's really important that Communities have the capacity and ability to come up with innovative solutions, right? Because many times we've worked on different projects. Um, I even come out the USAID representative, etc., and we have these suggestions. And they're like, "Sure, you know, that's right, that's great, right?" But they can come up with the solutions, and they usually come up with much better solutions, frankly, on some of the more perplexing questions that come about than we as development professionals, quote unquote, come up with, right? And so I think that that's some of the things, um, you know, we've come up with um, at one point in Honduras and also in, um, in Tanzania, we put together um, community-based pharmacy kits, right? Very basic kits worth the Ministry of Health that brought a low amount of income in that was an incentive, but in the ministry is sort of an outshoot of their own pharmacy at the local clinic. But that sort of innovative solution they came up with, right? And I think that that's one of the things we have to keep in mind is ask folks in their community what works. And you'll come up with a lot of these solutions. Just a quick question going off of what he was saying. How do you make sure because, you know, people move on because they they want to better their lives and now they have this, this uh, they learned all, all these things so that they can move on to an urban area and better their lives. So how do you make sure that in a country like Haiti where the government has very uh, limited financial resources, how do you make sure that they get paid? that they get uh, some sort of financial compensation. 
those right. community health workers. In, in Haiti, what has evolved is that the government has a certain level that they can pay. And often, I, I've seen community health workers in Haiti, Ajahn de Santé, they're called, who have, are responsible for 5,000 people. And, it's, and so, yes, they're paid, but no, they can't reach their population unless there's another. And that's where the NGOs have come in, because very often they've already trained the traditional birth attendants or they're training <coughs> women's groups, women's volunteers. Uh, and so the combination of the NGO and the government is what's working. Now, Paul Farmer's work, as you know, if you've read about Paul, they train the accompanateurs, and they pay the accompanateurs. But the government pays the community health worker who supervises or is part of the supervision of the accompanateurs. That's what's evolved in Haiti. Now, there's one group in Haiti that was smarter than, than most of us working in Haiti, and that is if you have this person who's a resident home visitor, and you pour all this training into them, they sign a contract that if they leave their village, they're no longer a community health worker or a resident home visitor in their village. Because what Haiti has today is community health workers in Port-au-Prince who claim to be from a certain village and are getting a salary, but they live in Port-au-Prince. So that's, that is a problem. I just want to quickly show you one slide that I think is a key to what they did in Mozambique, and they had a wonderful result. But here's the slide. They, instead of their community health workers, were often replaced by a group of mothers who said, we can do this. Let us do it. We can do more than that woman or that guy. We can take over. Or she's going to move to the city. We can take over. So the women formed care groups. And the care group gradually took over everything the community health worker was doing. But the complex, what I want you to see here, is it takes supervision. So they had five supervisors, <coughs> 26 animateurs that were paid. But every one of those animateurs had care groups of 10 to 15 volunteers. And this program had such tremendous results in Mozambique that Dr. Taylor couldn't believe it, took uh, Johns Hopkins students with him to Mozambique to do a survey to prove that they'd really done what they said they would and lowered tremendously the child mortality rates and the maternal mortality rates. So the lesson there was a group of women might replace one resident home visitor or community health worker. But if he or she does that, then those care groups have to depend on the volunteers in the villages. And at the very bottom, you see that when every 10 households in Mozambique there was a volunteer. And that volunteer signed up for a year only, and then she might be replaced by somebody else. But with this kind of structure, they had 100, almost 100% 100 coverage of immunization. Every pregnancy was registered. Every pregnancy outcome was known. And that was a very <coughs> successful program. So I just wanted to share that with you, because it's, it really shows the evolution of a community health worker system toward a care group that replaced the community health worker. And it actually worked and has been carefully studied. And I've got some interesting data on this if any of you are interested. Now, the other thing is we do skill by skill on the job training. And I've asked Lynn Gilbert, who's here, to show you what we mean by hands on training. This is about helping babies breathe. And if any of you are here, you should know that Dr. Stevens in Niermeyer's course in helping baby community is worth taking. So, Lynn, did you just want to... Have any of you taken it or done that helping baby breathe? Are any of you familiar with it? Okay. This, I think, was a very clever thing that they arranged. Um, this is uh, the not-so-dumb dummy to, to work with, Neil Natalie. Is, is her name, and they have it uh, set up so that you can simulate respirations or no respirations, and you can bag um, or uh, clear the airway with the, uh, a bulb here. And they have, a, in addition, the uh, flip chart so that you can do training with it. And they have several levels of trainees. You can train uh, for out, mostly rural out in the village. You can train hospital teams. 
And um, the idea is that in the first minute, or the golden minute, uh, if you don't get a baby to start breathing, uh, you're, you need to do a lot more to, to make sure that the child survives very quickly. But it starts out essentially with uh, checking for crying, and then if they're not crying, you start to stimulate them, keep them warm, and it, it's a very simple skill set. Uh, as long as they have, especially in hospitals, the bulb and the and the mask. So, if any of you would like to come up and take a look at it and see how cleverly this is put together, they can have a, a pulse. You can hear a pulse. You can keep one end in your pocket so that you, while you're training somebody, they can you can turn on the respirations or turn them off. So, it I think was very well thought out, and I. You want to come up and play with it? Please do. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that especially for coming with this because what what on the job training means this kind of work where we really allow people to practice and practice a skill until they've mastered the skill. And so skill by skill on the job training is a far cry from doing what I'm doing, which is coffee training. I'm not getting much of that. But I apologize for that. But Lynn will be here if some of you want to come and see this. I thank you very much, and I, I'm especially thankful to Steve Berman for all you're doing with the Center for Global Health. Thank you, Mitch, and uh, I think the fact that there's so many people here is uh, testifies of <coughs> the, their interest in this area and, and also their respect for everything that you, uh, you've done and accomplished uh, in this area. I'd just like to mention one thing in terms of community health workers. You know, it's not simply literacy. In our project in Guatemala with uh, traditional birth attendants, the comadronas, we've got a team that went down, they've been working with them, and they realized that they were almost all illiterate. And most traditional birth attendants are older women in their 70s. And, you know, uh, I mean, I've got two cataracts, and I'm younger than 70. And they're very common in, uh, in many of these countries. So they redesigned, our team redesigned the training for the pictures. And then they found out that not only were the comadronas illiterate, but they couldn't see either. And uh, so the next time we went down, we brought glasses with us. So uh, it, 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 you just have to be uh, very tuned in to, uh, People and to realize that uh, especially traditional birth attendants have a lot of experience and, and they can get by uh, <laughs> with, uh, with a lack of vision. So uh, I just, uh, uh, fortunately, they don't have to drive at night. So. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Well, we have a lot of experience with this area. So uh, as you go and think about this, you can contact through the Center for Global Health, you can talk to, contact any of us here today. They can find any one of us. Thank you. Yeah, and that's great. One quick message. Warren wrote a wonderful chapter in a book called Child Health, Child Health Advocacy on the Front Lines about uh, Gretchen and Warren's experience that they touched on on neonatal tetanus. And if anyone's interested in uh, purchasing the book, uh, the center has copies and, uh, and will even give it to you with the author's discount. <laughs>